Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. This is part two of an episode on Natalie Clifford Barney that was not planned to be two parts, but boy, did she get up to a lot. Uh, (laughs) In part one, we talked about her early life up to the death of her father, Albert. And then today we are going to talk about the rest. So as we said at the end of part one, Natalie Clifford Barney's father died in 1902, and under the terms of his will, Natalie, her mother Alice, and her sister Laura all became very wealthy. Alice started construction on a new home she called Studio House in Washington, D.C. In the words of biographer Suzanne Rodriguez, author of Wild Heart, Natalie Clifford Barney, and the Decadence of Literary Paris, quote, compared to other wealthy homes, Studio House was small. It had two basements. The sentence doesn't end there, but that is enough to give a sense that even if it was smaller than other rich people houses, it was still pretty big. It was a combined residence and studio space, and it had five bedrooms, three baths, a library, a room with a built-in stage, and two-story studio room for exhibition and entertainment. Today, Studio House is home to the Latvian Embassy. Yeah, when I read that sentence and it was just like, Studio House was small. It had two basements. Just the two. I started laughing. (laughs) Just the two. (laughs) Uh, Laura had become a Baha'i sometime around 1900, and her mother had joined the Baha'i faith not long afterward. After Albert's death, Laura spent some time with her mother, and then afterwards she traveled, including to the Middle East, to work with Abdul Baha, son of Baha'u'llah, founder of the Baha'i faith. And Natalie moved to France. She had spent much of her time there since starting boarding school at the age of 11, and from this point, her permanent home for the rest of her life was in or near Paris. She started out in the suburb of Neuilly, where she turned her home into a gathering place for artists and writers. She hosted all kinds of gatherings and parties, and arranged outdoor theatrical events and concerts in her gardens. She staged plays by Colette, who we covered in a previous two-parter, and Pierre-Louis, whose 1894 book, Chanson de Bility, came up in our episode on the poet Sappho. She was friends with both of those people. At one of these events, Barney hired the dancer Mata Hari to appear on horseback as Lady Godiva. Of course, this was well before Mata Hari uh, became notorious for being accused of spying. At this point, homosexuality was somewhat more socially acceptable in France than it was in the United States. Homosexual acts were illegal in the U.S., but had been decriminalized in France in 1791, although cross-dressing was still outlawed. There was still a lot of stigma around same-sex relationships, though, and a lot of people still considered homosexuality to be immoral or a perversion. And one of the things that Natalie Clifford Barney did as she established her adult life in France was to live in a way that was publicly, unabashedly, and enthusiastically lesbian. To be clear, her wealth gave her some protection here. People who were not rich enough to just do whatever they wanted had very different experiences when it came to things like homophobia and harassment. But she wanted to live by example and to show other people like herself that they did not have to live their lives with the shame and self-doubt that society tried to impose on them. She also continued pursuing relationships with other women. One was poet Lucy de la Rue Mardus, who was married, who Barney had met for the first time before her father's death. It is not totally clear whether they started their affair before or after the death of Albert Barney, but it followed the same basic trajectory as a number of Natalie's other relationships. Natalie pursued and eventually seduced Lucy, and then their relationship became very intense and very passionate. But eventually, Lucy started to become unhappy. In Lucy's case, this was both because of her feelings about Natalie's other relationships and about her own part in it. Lucy had been raised as a conservative Catholic, and so she felt a lot of guilt and shame around the breaking of her marriage vows. Then, eventually, their sexual relationship ended, but the two women eventually built a close friendship and, 
that continued for the rest of Lucy's life. Natalie had also been friends with Sidonie Gabrielle Colette, known just as Colette, for years by the time she moved to France for good. When they met, Colette was married to Henri Gautier Villard, aka Willie, who was publishing her writing under his name. As we talked about in our previous episodes on Colette, by 1905, they had started the process of legally separating their assets, although they were still married. In 1906, Colette came to stay with Natalie for a time after leaving Willie. They had a brief affair, and then they resumed their friendship, which again continued for the rest of Colette's life. Yeah, Colette's relationship with Willie wasn't over yet at that point, but should stay with uh, with Natalie for a while in the interim. Natalie had continued to be close to her first girlfriend, Eva Palmer, who we talked about in part one. But in 1907, the two women had a bitter falling out. Eva decided to marry Greek poet and playwright Angelos Cyclianos. They had met through Isadora Duncan. Angelos' sister, Penelope, was married to Duncan's brother, Raymond. As we talked about in our two-parter on Isadora Duncan, she was inspired by the aesthetics of ancient Greece, and the whole Duncan family had started doing things like wearing robes and sandals in an approximation of ancient Greek dress. Angelos also wanted to revive the literature and values of classical Greece. Eva had fallen in love with all of this and had fallen in love with Greece while traveling there. She wasn't really in love with Angelos, but she admired his work and his aspirations, and she liked the idea of the life that they could build together. Natalie, on the other hand, found it all ridiculous, and she did not even try to be nice about it. She criticized that whole robe and sandal situation and Angelo's writing and his hopes for a Greek revival and even told Eva that she needed to send him away. It really seems like Eva decided to marry Angelos because it was a way for her to have a life that sounded really appealing to her. One that was very, very Greek, complete with robes made of fabric she had woven herself and also very focused on literature and the arts she didn't really have an emotional connection with Angelos that would have threatened her bond with Natalie, which at that point they had been nurturing for almost 15 years. She did try to assuage Angelos's fears about Natalie by telling him that she loved him more than Natalie, while also telling Natalie that her relationship with Angelos could never replace the one that the two women had with each other. This all sounds like a tangle. Natalie's response to all of this was just so petty, including intentionally trying to do stuff to make Eva really jealous. And eventually, Eva was just done. Eva and Angelos got married in Bar Harbor later that year, and they pursued the life that they had been talking about when they decided to marry. In 1927, they held the first of two Delphic festivals, modeled after ancient Greek festivals that had combined athletic games with literature, theater, and the arts. Although they had an impact on Greek culture together, Eva's admiration for Angelos and his ideals doesn't seem to have been enough to build a happy marriage on. Reportedly, she eventually ended their physical relationship and the marriage was annulled in 1934, possibly in the wake of her traveling to the U.S. to try to raise money to sustain the Delphic Festival. Each of them later remarried other people, and at some point during all of this, Eva and Natalie made amends. To return to the timeline, in 1909, Natalie moved to a house on Rue Jacob. It's possible that one of her reasons for wanting to move to a new place was that her landlord in Nuit was increasingly critical of all these sapphic plays that she was staging out in her garden and the kinds of people that she was continually bringing together at her home. It is also possible, though, that she just wanted some kind of a fresh start. She had started looking for a new place to live in 1908, so that was not long after the end of her relationship with Pauline Tarn and her falling out with Eva. This move also put her into Paris proper, and in her words, quote, Paris has always seemed to me the only city where you can live and express yourself as you please. We will have more after a break. <laughs> 
Natalie Clifford Barney's new home at 20 Rue Jacob was on the left bank south of the Seine, a neighborhood that was known for its community of writers and artists, which later had a reputation for its really bohemian atmosphere. It hadn't quite gotten there yet when she moved in, but later it did. The house had been built in the 17th century, and it had a Doric temple out in the garden, which had Temple Alamity, or Temple of Friendship, carved into its lentil. She had some restoration work done on this temple, and the garden and the house and the temple became home to her very famous weekly salon, which she called her Fridays. The salon is the thing Natalie Clifford Barney is most well-known for, except maybe for her romantic relationships, which sometimes overshadow everything else. She held the salon every week starting in 1909 and continuing for more than 50 years, except when she was traveling or otherwise out of the city. And sometimes there were more than 100 people in attendance. This is often described as being inspired by the poet Sappho, which includes the museum signage we read at the beginning of the episode in part one. But this was open to anybody regardless of their gender. Guests included writers like Colette and Gertrude Stein, but also Ezra Pound, James Joyce, Ernest Hemingway, T.S. Eliot, all same expatriate writers who Gertrude Stein also knew. Uh, This was about literature and the arts. But at the same time, there was a definite focus on encouraging and nurturing the creative work of women specifically. Men were allowed, but women were celebrated. As we discussed earlier, Barney had also made herself into a living example of how someone could live a publicly lesbian life without shame or self-doubt. She continued this after moving to Rue Jacob, and she intentionally focused her salon on allowing other women to do the same. Historian Lillian Faderman framed this as, quote, a support group for lesbians to permit them to create a self-image which literature and society denied them. And she also helped women writers and artists in more direct ways. At first, this was usually more about her time and her attention than it was about money. Like, she would help connect people to publishers or promote their work or find teachers. Um, She did that a lot more often than doing something like directly funding somebody else's creative endeavors. This shifted a little bit later on, but early in the 20th century, her encouragement of other writers and artists was more about helping people get attention and resources than it was about, like, becoming somebody's financial patron. Also in 1909, Natalie met Antoinette Corressin d'Elisabeth, Duchess of Clermont-Tonnerre, known as Lily, who was married to Philibert de Clermont-Tonnerre. They met through Lucie de la Rue Mardu, who we mentioned earlier. This would be one of Barney's longest relationships. We read from the marriage contract that they would go on to write together in part one of this episode, and they celebrated their anniversary on May 1st every year until Lily's death, with the exception of the years that they were separated due to war. Lily was a poet and a translator and had published the first French translations of the works of John Keats. In 1910, Barney was connected to a scandal that for once did not have to do with her love life. Her sister, Laura, had made a plaster copy of a sculpture and sent it to her mother's home of studio house in Washington, D.C., with instructions to keep it outside and covered and to have it sprinkled with water every day to allow this plaster to cure and harden. There are slightly different details of exactly what happened in various news reports and and whatever, but, like, the point is there was a statue It was covered up. This all seemed to go fine until one day the cover blew off of it and it turned out this sculpture was of a reclining nude woman. It probably would not raise many eyebrows today, but for this nude woman statue to be out in front of a home in Washington, D.C. in 1910 just caused a lot of outrage. It was also rumored that Natalie had been the model for the sculpture and not really clear whether that's the case. She does seem to have denied that, though. Scandal! (laughs) Barney published three books that year. Éparpillement, Je me souviens, and Acte et Entracte. Éparpillement, or Scatterings, was essentially a collection of epigrams. 
Barney was known for having an epigrammatic wit. She would basically sit at the salon, listening to what was going on around her, and then toss off a very clever sentence or two. Barney's most popular published works were her epigram collections. Je me souviens was a prose poem about Pauline Tarn, also known as René Vivienne, which she had written years before, but she didn't publish it until after Tarn's death. And Acte en Tracte was a collection of short dramatic works and poetry. That same year, Barney also made friends with poet Rémy de Gourmont, who helped popularize Eparpillement after she gave him a copy. Rémy de Gourmont is who nicknamed Barney the Amazon, thanks to both her skill with horses and her reputation as a lover. He went on to publish two books that were pretty much fictionalized letters to her. They were Lettres à l'Amazon in 1914 and Lettres intimes à l'Amazon, which was published posthumously in 1927. In 1911, Natalie's mother Alice married Christian Hemmick, and her sister Laura married Hippolyte Dreyfus in a double wedding. Dreyfus was the first French Baha'i, and he and Laura each took the surname Dreyfus Barney. Hemmick was much younger than Alice. She was 61 and he was 26, so he was also younger than both her daughters. Neither daughter was happy about this, but it did seem like Christian made their mother happy. At the same time, this marriage was widely written about in tabloids and gossip columns, many of them implying that he was after Alice's money. After she put that money into an irrevocable trust that would eventually go to her daughters, the headlines started focusing on how much money she'd been willing to cut herself off from in order to marry this very young man. Alice's marriage fell apart during World War I. In part one of this episode, we talked about how she had been planning to stay with Natalie while dealing with some drama of her own, but had at least temporarily changed her mind because of her complicated feelings about her daughter's sexuality. That drama was the end of her marriage to Christian Hemmick. Hemmick claimed that the marriage had fallen apart because Alice did not approve of his involvement in the theater, but the last straw was apparently his affair with a young actor, specifically a young male actor. Also during World War I, the focus of Barney's Friday Salon shifted. She was vehemently opposed to the war. While many of her friends started working as nurses or ambulance drivers or journalists, Barney felt like working toward the war effort would essentially be condoning it. So she stayed home, and she turned the salon into a meeting for pacifists and anti-war activists, and hosted a women's conference for peace. The closest thing she did to becoming directly involved in the war effort was hosting a movie night for wounded soldiers. During the early months of the war, Natalie also met one of the other great loves of her life, painter Romaine Brooks. Brooks had wanted to volunteer as an ambulance driver during the war, but could not because of a back problem. Instead, she had established a fund to help artists who had been injured in battle. Her relationship with Natalie Clifford Barney lasted for more than 50 years. In 1920, Natalie Clifford Barney started a collaboration with American poet Ezra Pound on a project called Bel Esprit. Their plan was that they would choose two writers, one working in English and one in French, and they would fund their work. This plan never came to fruition, though. They chose T.S. Eliot for the English-language writer and Paul Valéry for French, but neither of them accepted their financial help. This doesn't seem to have been connected to their feelings about Barney or Pound. Both writers were coming into other sources of funding, so they just didn't really need this kind of patronage. Yeah, if I'm remembering correctly, this was like right after T.S. Eliot published The Wasteland and then suddenly had other opportunities. I, I don't remember what exactly had happened with uh, with Paul Val- Valéry. But uh, to just move ahead a little bit, it's likely that Barney met Gertrude Stein and Alice B. Toklas for the first time in 1926. Stein and Toklas had been living at 27 Rue de Fleurou, which was maybe a 20-minute walk away from where Barney lived, at least according to Google Maps. They'd been living there since 1903. But even though Stein and Toklas were also Americans, and they also hosted a famous literary salon, and they knew and were friends with just so many of these same people, they also led very different lives from Natalie Clifford Barney, 
Stein and Toklas had met in 1907, and they had been in a committed relationship with each other and only each other for almost 20 years. This was just not how Natalie Clifford Barney approached her relationships at all. There does not seem to be any clear documentation about why it took so long for these women to make one another's acquaintance, but it does not seem like it was just happenstance that it took more than 15 years. Like, you would need to be kind of going out of your way to avoid each other at that point. In 1927, Barney established l'Académie des Femmes, or Women's Academy. This was in response to the refusal of the Académie Française to admit women into its ruling council of 40 immortals. L'Académie des Femmes' first honorees included Colette and Gertrude Stein. Although this effort doesn't seem to have lasted for very long, it was notable in that it brought additional attention to the work of women writers in France who were not being taken seriously by the French literary establishment. Also in 1927, Barney met Dolly Wilde, niece of Oscar Wilde. She's often described as another of Barney's great loves, although their relationship, as many of them were, was definitely tumultuous, and she and Romaine Brooks did not get along. In 1928, Radcliffe Hall published The Well of Loneliness, a highly autobiographical novel that tells the story of Stephen Gordon, who is, of course, patterned after Hall. Another character, Valerie Seymour, is a lightly fictionalized version of Natalie Clifford Barney. These two characters are dramatically different from one another. Stephen is plagued with shame and self-doubt, while Valerie is the exact opposite. This novel was both groundbreaking and controversial, and it was immediately banned in the UK. The year after it made its debut, Radcliffe Hall was a guest of honor at Barney's Salon, along with longtime partner Una Trubridge. To pause for just a moment, at this point, the way most people talked about and conceptualized sexuality and gender was generally much different from how it is today. Many psychologists, sociologists, and the like lumped gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender people all together under the label of sexual invert. One prevailing theory was that lesbians were men trapped in women's bodies and gay men were women trapped in men's bodies. And the vast majority of psychologists and other researchers saw all of this as deviant and pathological There were some exceptions, including Magnus Hirschfeld, who we talked about on the show in 2018, but for the most part, sexuality and gender were conflated in a lot of ways that they really aren't today. Natalie Clifford Barney did not agree with the idea that she was a man trapped in a woman's body, and this fed into a dislike of what she perceived as cross-dressing. We talked in part one about how she dressed as a page to visit Leanne de Pougy for the first time, but that was different. That was a costume. She didn't consider that her mode of dress. Right, that was not her everyday wear at all. Radcliffe Hall and Una Trubridge, on the other hand, wore the kinds of suits that would have been more commonly worn by men. There are some scholars today who interpret Radcliffe Hall, who identified as an invert, as a trans man. But Barney and some of her friends made fun of Hall and Truebridge for what they chose to wear and how they carried themselves. We will get to Barney's life during the Great Depression and World War II after a sponsor break. After the Great Depression started in 1929, many, but definitely not all, of the American writers and artists who had been frequenting Barney's Salon returned home. So her Fridays were somewhat smaller, both in terms of their attendance and their extravagance until the economy started to improve. Overall, though, the Barney family's finances just weren't too terribly affected by it. Like, Natalie and her mother and sister, they all had a lot of money. Uh, Alice had less money to access than her daughters did, so it it does seem like she felt it a lot more, but there are times when Natalie seemed oblivious to the fact that there was a depression going on. Natalie and Romaine Brooks also took a trip to North America in late 1929, spending some time in New York before Natalie spent six weeks traveling with her mother. 
This was the last visit they had together. They were preparing for another when Alice died on October 12, 1931. That same year, Romaine Brooks gave Natalie an ultimatum that either she end her relationship with Dolly Wilde or Romaine would leave. As we said earlier, Romaine did not like Dolly. Among other things, she found Dolly to be immature and shallow. She did not like Dolly's heavy drug and alcohol use. After kind of agonizing about what to do for a while, Natalie eventually chose Romaine, although Romaine did eventually allow her to see Dolly again. In the early months of World War II in Europe, Natalie made arrangements for Dolly Wilde to go to London. Natalie's sister Laura returned to the United States. Her husband, Hippolyte Dreyfus Barney, had died in 1928. And while he was a Baha'i at the time of his death, he was also Jewish by birth. The Nazis had also banned the Baha'i faith in Germany, and Baha'is faced persecution, mass arrest, and death under the Nazi regime. So as the widow of a Jewish man and a Baha'i herself, Laura was at risk. Yeah, it's not really relevant whether he considered himself Jewish at that point, and I could not say, like, how... I did not read any of his own writing on this, but, like, to the Nazis, he was Jewish. Uh, Natalie initially decided to join Romaine Brooks in Florence, where Romaine had been living. She made this decision before Italy formally entered the war. Apparently, they expected Italy to remain neutral. Of course, that neutrality perceived did not last long at all. And then by the time she and Romaine decided that they should try to get out of Europe, they could not get a travel permit to do so. So they were stuck in fascist Italy for the duration. Although Barney had been vocally opposed to World War I, her beliefs during World War II are a bit more complicated, as was the case with Gertrude Stein's working as a propagandist for the Vichy government during the Nazi occupation of France. It's not clear how much of this was her attempt to survive and how much reflected her actual beliefs. One of Barney's great-grandparents was Jewish, and she had previously written about her Jewish ancestry with pride, But under the Nuremberg race laws, one Jewish great-grandparent meant that she was mixed race. Her landlords at 20 Rue Jacob were also Jewish, and at one point during the German occupation of Paris, Nazis tried to seize everything from her home. Berthe Clairou, Bernie's housekeeper for about 50 years, somehow convinced them that they'd confused Natalie with her sister Laura and that Laura was now in the United States. Yeah, I've don't fully understand how she managed to, like, get the Nazis to mostly leave uh, Barney's home in Paris alone. Had Barney stayed in Paris, she certainly would have been arrested. Uh, After Hitler came to power in Germany, Barney had stopped talking about her Jewish ancestry. And at the beginning of the war, she also published another book of epigrams called Nouvelle Pensée de l'Amazon, and some of these were kind of anti-Semitic. Barney and Brooks also seem to have genuinely believed a lot of the fascist propaganda that they were exposed to while living in Italy, which framed the United States as the aggressors in the war. Some of Barney's wartime writing expressed support for Italy's fascist government. It is not possible to simply write all of this off as her just trying to stay under the radar during the war, though. Some of Barney's earlier epigrams had also played into negative stereotypes of Jewish people. And while she had always been really ahead of her time in terms of things like same-sex relationships, her overall politics tended to be more conservative when she was aware of what was going on politically at all. She was close friends and collaborators with Ezra Pound, who was deeply anti-Semitic. At the same time, Barney also used her wealth and connections to try to get Jewish friends out of Europe and to support other people who had to flee. According to some sources, when Colette's husband, Maurice Goudiquet, was arrested by the Gestapo, Barney was one of the people who tried to get him released. During the war... She lost a lot of people. On April 10th, 1941, Dolly Wilde died. Her official cause of death was undetermined. Some sources cited breast cancer, and others said that she had taken her own life. Lucie Delarue Mardu also died in 1945. And Barney had other friends and former partners who died during the war. These were mostly unrelated to things that actually had to do with the fighting or the effects of the fighting. 
In addition to her grief over these deaths, she just found it upsetting that she couldn't be there for any of these people. And in a lot of cases, she did not even hear about any of their deaths until much, much later. While World War II ended in Europe in 1945, Barney couldn't return to Paris until 1946. Romaine Brooks remained in Florence. At first, Natalie had to move into her sister's old apartment because the house on Rue Jacob had fallen into so much disrepair while she was away during the war. She could not start hosting her Fridays again until 1949, and then she could no longer use the Doric Temple in the garden because the floor had collapsed. Food had always been a big part of these gatherings, and that was even more true in the post-war years. There was still so much deprivation, and many of the writers and artists who attended were not getting enough to eat. Barney was impressed at how Bert Clairegu managed to pull it off every week. Gertrude Stein died in 1946, and after this, Barney became closer friends with Alice B. Toklas. Eva Palmer died in 1952. Colette died in 1954. So did Elizabeth de Grammel, known as Lily, at the age of 79. Her relationship with Barney had continued until the end of her life. Then Marie Laurence Sand died in 1957. Barney outlived a lot of her friends and former partners. Like Stein and Toklas, her salon had brought together some of the early 20th century's foremost writers and artists and had influenced the development of modernism. But through the 1960s, attendance at her salons gradually got smaller, and both Barney and her Fridays were seen as less groundbreaking and less relevant. She and Laura started making plans for what would happen after their deaths, and they decided that rather than being buried by her husband in Montmartre, that Laura would be buried next to Natalie in Passy Cemetery in a plot that had been given to Natalie by a friend several years before. In 1962, Barney had two heart attacks, and by 1965, she needed help just with her day-to-day living. This came from her housekeeper, Bert, and also from Janine Lahovery, whose relationship with Barney had started in the 1950s. Then, in 1966, Barney was served notice that she would have to move out of the house on Rue Jacob in 1970. This four-year notice was legally required, and the fact that it was given at all led to outrage, especially among the people who recognized the importance of the salon she had hosted there for so many years. The landlord started construction work on the property, which also raised people's ire, and used that as a way to make living there unpleasant enough that maybe Barney would just move out early. Yeah, the landlord seems to have sort of been like, maybe if I just turn the kitchen into a construction zone, you'll get fed up with this and I won't have to wait four whole years. Uh, Toward the end of the 1960s, as all of this was going on, Barney's relationship with Romaine Brooks fell apart and Brooks stopped answering her letters. To Barney, this was really devastating. And then Romaine Brooks died in 1970. Natalie Clifford Barney died in Paris on February 2nd, 1972, at the age of 95, in the arms of Janine Lahovery. During her lifetime, she had published 12 books and written tons of other unpublished material, including at least 40,000 letters. Barney's tombstone at Pessy Cemetery described her as écrivain, or writer, followed by Elle puis l'Amazon de Rami de Gourmont. At her request, the tombstone also bore the inscription, Je suis cet être légendaire au je revis. I probably said that very badly, but it roughly translates as, I am this legendary being in which I will live again. She was fictionalized in a number of novels about Paris in the early 20th century, including, as we mentioned earlier, Radcliffe Hall's The Well of Loneliness. The Well of Loneliness entered the public domain in the U.S. this year, so let's read some of its description of Barney's counterpart, Valerie Seymour. Quote, Valerie, placid and self-assured, created an atmosphere of courage. Everyone felt very normal and brave when they gathered at Valerie Seymour's. There she was, this charming and cultured woman, a kind of lighthouse in a storm-swept ocean. The waves had lashed round her feet in vain. Winds had howled. Clouds had spewed forth their hail and their lightning. Torrents had deluged but had not destroyed her. The storm's gathering force broke and drifted away, leaving behind them the shipwrecked, the drowning. 
But when they looked up the poor, spluttering victims, why, what should they see but Valerie Seymour? Then a few would strike boldly out for the shore at the sight of this indestructible creature. She did nothing, and at all times said very little, feeling no urge towards philanthropy. But this much she gave to her brethren, the freedom of her salon, the protection of her friendship. That book also includes the quote, her love affairs would fill quite three volumes, even after they had been expurgated. Uh, I don't think poetry was really Natalie Clifford Barney's greatest genre of writing. Like, she didn't publish that much of it in English, but what she did publish in English, I would not rank among the great poets. However, some of that English poetry is in the public domain now, so we can include one. This is The Phantom Guest. We lay in shade diaphanous and spoke the light that burns in us. As in the glooming's net, I caught her. She shimmered like reflected water. Romantic and emphatic moods are not for her whom life eludes. Is vulgar tinsel round her fold? She'd rather shudder with the cold. Attend just this elusive hour. A shadow in a shadow bower. A moving imagery so fine it must have been her soul near mine. And so we blended and possessed each in each the phantom guest. In separate, we scarcely met. Yet other love nights we forget. And then we'll just end with one final epigram by Natalie Clifford Barney. This one was actually quoted in the biography we have mentioned a couple of times, which was Wild Heart, A Life, Uh, Natalie Clifford Barney and the Decadence of Literary Paris. Quote, When it comes to friendship, I am very lazy. Once I confer friendship, I never take it back. It's just easier. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, That's Natalie Clifford Barney. She's a lot. Do you have a listener mail that's maybe less dramatic than I do have listener mail. It is from Elizabeth. (laughs) And Elizabeth's title of the email is Wooly Dogs and the Sandal in the Well. Dear Holly and Tracy, last week I was on my way to give blood when the portion of Unearthed about the Salish woolly dog came in. I had to sit in the parking lot and listen to it, even though I could have just hit pause. I'm a middle school science teacher, and I have just read an article with my students about genetic research done to find native dogs of the Americas. The article talks about how researchers were looking at mitochondrial DNA to determine which dog breeds predate Europeans and the Americas. They found that the Mexican and Peruvian hairless dogs, the Chihuahua, and the Carolina dog all predate Europeans, and the Chihuahua had DNA not found in dogs anywhere else in the world. The article also talked about some of the lost breeds, including the woolly dog. The article shared the old ideas that the Salish had allowed the dogs to be lost to interbreeding because of the availability of other wool sources Next year, when we read this, I will be sharing the new understanding from this research. I love when I can bring new research into my science classes to show that our understanding of the world changes over time. Also, I appreciate your highlighting of the involvement of the tribal peoples in this work. Here in Idaho, we have many active and vibrant tribes, but it feels like my students are often presented with Native peoples as if they are just history and not part of our modern state and country. And then... Last night, I listened to the behind the scenes, and your discussion of the sandal in the well made me think of an exhibit I saw in France in the early 90s that featured the shoe that Marie Antoinette lost on her way to the guillotine. It was in an empty white room with blank white walls. The only thing in the room was the shoe on a pedestal. Uh, Elizabeth says, dust off your French, and uh, had a link to a video about this, um, I feel like I would have followed the video pretty well if it had had captioning. Um, But just trying to listen to the French was a little too fast for me to keep up up with. Uh, As you talked, I could see something similar happening with the sandal with long discussions of where it came from and how it ended up in the well. I particularly like your idea of a sibling prank. I know it is something my brother would have done. It just seemed like such an odd little bit of history. I thought you might enjoy it. Thank you for the many hours of entertainment and education, Elizabeth. Pet tax below. So we have Ziggy, a 13-year-old shelter mutt, and Goose, a 4-year-old cat, found as a kitten under some hay bales. Had to be bottle-fed for a few weeks. Uh, I sure have bottle-fed some abandoned kitty cats before 
uh, something that simultaneously I enjoyed doing, but also it was so much because I feel like this litter was like six kittens. It's so much work. That needed to just, it was, we're just continually bottle feeding. And then we have Taya, who uh, was taken in about 18 months ago when Taya's owner died. Um, so sweet. This is a dog who is deaf and vision impaired and anxious, but such a sweet, little cute dog. Uh, I can tell from this, this dog has a very anxious face, I will say. I feel like I can tell that this is a little a little uh, high-strung, maybe. Uh, there's Friday, a six-year-old Aussie, and Hank, the classroom turtle. Because you sew and said send other pictures, I'm really happy how this long jacket turned out, especially the pockets made from a thrift store curtain and lined with the cotton curtain lining. Uh, this is like a long jacket, um, with a design of sort of flowery, leafy vines. I like it very much. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, for all of this. 100% of it. I love the animal pictures. I love the jacket picture. I love the turtle picture. I love the ex- story of your experience with uh, this, this episode and the behind the scenes. If you would like to write to us about this or any other podcast, we're at History Podcast at iHeartRadio.com. You can kind of find us on social media. We mostly just post the episodes being live. Uh, And you can subscribe to our show on the iHeartRadio app and wherever else you like to get your podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. (laughs) 